Well, before we get into the sermon, how about we have another time of prayer for this time in the Word? Father, as we open our Bibles to the words of Jesus and try to study them as well as we're able, we ask you to bless the effort. Uh, Here we are uh, trying very hard to hear as well as we can, and we just ask that you unfold the secrets of your word and help us to understand, help us to digest them and to live by them. And today, of course, is a you know, rather difficult sermon in a rather difficult series overall. And I just ask your help for me to explain things well and for your people that just hearts and minds would be opened and focused. And we ask that this effort we put into your word would enrich us just as Christ intended when he spoke these words and just as you intend through your Holy Spirit. And we ask this with a hope of you know, just growing all the more into the measure of Christ and understanding the world around us and thinking about it in the way we should and living accordingly. And we ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, today I'm uh, continuing my talk through section 6 of Matthew's Gospel where we've been for some time and uh, will be for some time. And I've titled this whole section, Jesus Pronounces Judgment Against Israel and Its Leaders. And of course, the nation overall has not responded well to Christ uh, this far into his ministry. We're in the last week of his ministry. And the leaders in particular have not responded well. And therefore, Jesus has many strong words for them when he does come to Jerusalem toward the end of his ministry. And this section describes those events you know, there in his final visit to Jerusalem in the last week before his crucifixion. And as of now, in section 6, I'm teaching through the fifth portion and final portion of that section as I've outlined Matthew's gospel for you. And this portion is entirely dedicated to a private sermon from Jesus to his disciples, which we call the Olivet Discourse. That is the 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 discourse that he gave on the Mount of Olives, which is where this is located just outside of Jerusalem. This is Matthew chapters 24 through 25. And in this portion, Jesus predicts and describes the destruction of Jerusalem's temple, his second coming, and the end of the age. Now, my previous sermon on all this was called Romans and Rebels, which I taught a week ago. And in that sermon, I gave you a brief history of the great Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire. And I did that uh, because I know that's not something that is largely taught and known in most history courses and history curriculum. So I wanted to make sure we all had a good amount of information. And if you still have the handout that I gave you, I gave a summary of all that on the back of that handout. If you don't, there's more over there on the uh, bookcase over there, I believe. And that brief history was also necessary because I think we're moving into that part of the Olivet Discourse where Jesus is describing that very time in history. He calls it the Great Tribulation of Judea, and I think that is the time when the Jews tried to revolt against Rome there in the uh, late 60s and early 70s of the first century. So speaking of that, let's go ahead and read what Jesus says about that time. This is Matthew 24, verses 15 through 21. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And today I'm going to begin to explain the details of this passage, starting with the abomination of desolation mentioned by Jesus. 
And you know, right from the very beginning of this passage, that's a pretty big detail to try to understand and explain. Jesus gives his source for this phrase, at least, which does help us. He says it's from the book of the prophet Daniel, which we have in the Old Testament. So that in itself is helpful. And since Jesus has directed us to Daniel, we must dedicate some time to Daniel to determine the meaning of this abomination of desolation. So I don't want to just you know, skip by uh, a, an occasion when Jesus has actually cited his source for us. I want to make use of this time to delve into the details of that. Since today's sermon is describing the uh, abomination of desolation, and since that phrase is somewhat catchy, I've decided to just make that the title for this sermon. So today is the abomination of desolation, both in theme and in title. And as for my outline today, I have six headings for you as I try to trace through the many, many things we have to cover as we try to make sense of this abomination of desolation. Here's my outline for you. First of all, just want to observe that the wording used in the Gospels and also in Daniel connects well to the great Jewish revolt. So this phrase, abomination of desolation, fits that time very well that I think Jesus is describing in the great Jewish revolt. Secondly, I want to make some introductory comments about the book of Daniel and also a disclaimer. I want to give you some context, basically, for my comments about the book of Daniel in this particular sermon. And that's what the second heading is dedicated to doing. Thirdly, I want to tell you about a king mentioned by Daniel named Antiochus IV. He's not mentioned by Daniel by name, but he is very much a part of Daniel's book. And I'll explain what I mean by that when I get there. Fourthly, in two of the passages where Daniel mentions this abomination of desolation, he uses this phrase for what Antiochus IV did to the Jews and especially to their temple. So that will be uh, yet another history lesson for you. I know there's a lot of history going into these sermons these days, but I got to make sure you have all the context you need to uh, understand the things Jesus is saying and Daniel is saying. So more history about Antiochus IV. And then fifthly, uh, Daniel implies, or seems to imply at least, a later Roman version of Antiochus IV. And there's where we get into the, uh, the significance for how Jesus uses this phrase from Daniel and how he means to apply it. I think that we have, in a sense, a, uh, a copycat or an echo, you might say, of Antiochus IV during the Roman period of history, which I'll explain when I get there. And then sixthly, last heading for today, based on all of this, I think Christ has reasonably predicted another abomination of desolation during the coming revolt of the Jews against Rome. So by the time we get there, I aim to say that what Jesus does in this passage does make sense once you string all these historical and biblical details together. And you might be getting the impression that today's sermon is going to be very dense, and it is going to be very dense. Uh, there's a lot to cover in only an hour of time. And by the time we're done with it, you might be thinking one of two things, that we've either done too much or we've done too little. And to be honest with you, it's been hard to balance that. On the one hand, I don't want to just skip over uh, Jesus' reference to Daniel. I want to spend some time on that. And yet Daniel, of course, is a very complicated book worthy of many more sermons than this one today. And so, you know, you might be wanting more, you might be wishing for less by the time we're done. I've tried to mediate those concerns by limiting all this to one sermon, but that does require a very dense sermon. And I'm hoping that there's enough here, though, by the end of it, that you can look at what Jesus says here, and it makes some amount of sense to you what he's doing. So that is what we're trying to do today. So let's get started on that with the very first heading that I had for you. And this first heading, of course, centers very much on the wording, the phrasing, abomination of desolation. And I want to make the point that uh, this wording used in the Gospels and also in Daniel connects very well to the great Jewish revolt that we've been talking about and that I plan to talk about more uh, here in this passage. Now, I actually want to start with Luke's account of what Jesus said. Uh, as opposed to Matthew's account of our passage. Uh, 
Uh, on the one hand, Luke does record something rather different if you, if you read his uh, gospel and compare it to Matthew. On the other hand, Luke does have some of this wording. So I just want to see that first so we can get that in our minds as we talk about these things. I'm going to read Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24, in case any of you want to turn there or uh, refer to that later whenever we're done today. So here's how Luke records the words of Jesus from the same passage over in Matthew. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Luke's description is a reasonable summary of the events of the great Jewish revolt. If you compare what Luke says there to the things that I shared with you last time in my uh, history lesson on the great Jewish revolt, you'll see that. We see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, uh, people in Judea being slain, Jews being taken captive among the nations, and the city being trampled by Gentiles, all of which happened, as we know from Josephus' account and maybe a few other sources, um, those things very much did happen, very much as Luke summarizes them there. And yet, uh, Luke, for all of that, makes no clear reference to Daniel's abomination of desolation, uh, whereas Matthew and Mark do. Luke does not mention the phrase abomination of desolation, nor does he refer to the prophet Daniel. In all likelihood, this represents Luke's effort to uh, clarify a very ambiguous phrase used by Jesus, the abomination of desolation. Like, we're going to spend a whole sermon today figuring out at least somewhat what that is. And I think Luke just said to himself, you know what, let's make that a bit easier. Let's smooth that out and talk about you know, things as they literally happened. And that is very helpful, of course. Uh, we're not going to frown upon Luke's effort to make sure we understand Jesus. That's very helpful that he does that. And besides, Luke does retain some of this wording. You might remember, as we read that passage, he does say that Jerusalem's desolation is near once you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. So he does retain some of that language from the phrase abomination of desolation in his passage. Now, that's all I have to say about Luke's contribution for the moment. I just wanted to get that in front of you so that we can uh, assess that along with everything else. Uh, right now, I want to come back to Matthew and also to Mark, who is very similar to Matthew in this regard. I want to deal with the abomination of desolation as described by Jesus. And again, here talking about the words being used. I want to make sure we understand these words and we're not just saying them. So let's talk about them. Christ first refers to this event as an abomination. Now, the Greek word used by Matthew and Mark refers literally to anything you find disgusting. So that is kind of the word that uh, was chosen whenever Matthew and Mark wrote these things in Greek. Uh, so think of your gag reflex anytime you get that sudden urge to vomit, you know, whatever may have caused you to do that. That kind of thing, that is an abomination uh, based on the wording here used in our Greek New Testament from Matthew and Mark. Now, Jesus further describes this event as the abomination of desolation. So you've got, first of all, that kind of gag reflex there, but the, uh, the end result there is desolation. Now, desolation refers to being void of life. If you're in a desolate place, it means nothing lives there. Now, even in Matthew's gospel, uh, we can connect this desolation to something specifically about Jerusalem. We just have to remember, you know, jump back to the end of chapter 23, what Jesus was saying just before all of this. Uh, you go back to verse uh, 38 there in 23. He says to the Jews, behold, your house is being left to you desolate. You know, that was his warning 
to the uh, leaders there in Jerusalem. So desolation mentioned there. So through this uh, disgusting abomination that he has in mind, Jerusalem is about to be cleared of life, left desolate. You know, no living soul there. That's the idea. Now, of course, Jesus connects this phrase of the book of Daniel, which has three passages that use these words that we're talking about, abomination and desolation. And we'll read all three of those in the course of this sermon, so I don't need to read them now. But again, I just want to refer more broadly to the words being used by Daniel in his book. If we compare uh, the, <coughs> the Greek uh, text of Matthew and Mark to later Greek translation of Daniel, it is in fact the same two words. So Matthew and Mark, as they record the words of Jesus for us in Greek, um, they're very much basing that off of you know, how they had already translated Daniel, it seems. So there's a very strong connection here between what Jesus says and what Matthew and Mark record and what was happening in Daniel's book originally. Now, of course, Daniel's book was written not in Greek originally. It was written partially in Aramaic and partially in Hebrew. And these passages that we have in mind today come from the Hebrew parts. So what are the Hebrew words when we talk about abomination and desolation? Well, the Hebrew word for abomination is very often used specifically for unclean objects and animals in the book of Leviticus in particular. So this is a very ritual word. They have this idea of cleanliness and being defiled by certain objects, certain animals. And this is the word that they would have used for those kinds of things. So very unclean ritually, according to the law of Moses. As for the word desolation, uh, not so different from the Greek word, but the Hebrew word is usually uh, employed to talk about ruins. So if you come to a city or a building that's been knocked down and pulverized, the result is what they would refer to as a desolation. So a desolate city or a desolate building. And as you've been hearing me talk about all this, I hope you're kind of putting it all together. Uh, everything about this abomination, whether in the Gospels or in Daniel, whether we're talking about the Greek words or the original Hebrew words from Daniel, it all connects very well to the time of the great Jewish revolt. You have this very uh, defiling, ruinous experience. You have this loathsome, disgusting uh, void of life you know, left behind after the Romans were done there in Jerusalem. So it all fits very, very well. Not by any means a stretch to see why Christ might be referring to an abomination of desolation at the time of the great Jewish revolt. It all fits remarkably well with what we were discussing last time. Now for my second heading, I want to shift gears and make some introductory comments about the book of Daniel and also a disclaimer about the book of Daniel and my comments on the book of Daniel in particular. So this is, again, just kind of giving you some context as we begin to talk about the book of Daniel itself. So Daniel the prophet, uh, the man, was born about 600 years before Christ. So we're reaching pretty far back from the time of Jesus. Daniel spent most of his life under the power of Babylon, the nation which conquered Jerusalem and took the Jews into exile. So as a young man, we actually read in the book of Daniel, he was taken from the ruins of Jerusalem and brought into the service of a pagan king. Toward the end of his life, Daniel would have seen the empire, another empire of the Medes and the Persians take over uh, as the uh, ruling power in those parts, you know, taking over Babylon and becoming the new dominant nation. And Daniel would go on to serve that empire. So he uh, lived through some pretty tumultuous times overall. Now as for the book of Daniel, it primarily makes a statement if there is any one point being made by Daniel's book, it's that God controls the kingdoms of the earth. It is the sovereignty of God over the events of the nations of the world. Now, the book of Daniel portrays the sovereignty of God over all nations, mainly by describing history. He goes through a lot of events, all in very visionary and symbolic language, of course, and very vague and somewhat ambiguous language, perhaps. But he's doing all of that to talk about the events of the world. And he shows how all of those events are going to culminate in this one great kingdom of God, which will never fall. 
unlike all these other kingdoms which do fall, and he very often details their fall, unlike all those kingdoms, the kingdom of God will last forever. In the meantime, the people of God will very often suffer. They will suffer at the hands of uh, very, uh, very uh, I don't know, ardently, kings very much bent on persecution is what I'm trying to say. And they'll have to go through all of that as well as the general rise and fall of nations. But if they remain faithful, they will enjoy this kingdom of God that he has planned at the end of this particular history that Daniel has for us. Now today, I desire to be very restrained in my comments about Daniel. This is uh, not by any means meant to be a how-to of reading the book of Daniel, nor even a comment on every single thing Daniel says. Certainly not. This is only one sermon. The book of Daniel is at once mesmerizing and also bewildering, uh, so it does generate a lot of interest, whether because of how exotic it can seem or just because of how confusing it can be. For one reason or another, Christians like to uh, very much fasten on the book of Daniel. I myself would only ever dare to teach on the book of Daniel in a more complete way after I had done much more study, probably study through the entire book and get everything straightened out perfectly before I began teaching on it, just because it is that difficult. So I do not want myself, of course, to say very much about Daniel today because I've not done any of that. I've not done the heavy research and study into Daniel that I normally would if I were really going to teach through that book. Uh, the problem is not every Christian has my sense of restraint on these things. And many Christians have sort of plowed in and said a lot of things about the book of Daniel, said a lot of things from the book of Daniel, and made it a very popular book, especially among those who fancy themselves prophecy scholars. I don't know if that's actually still a click among Christians or not, but it certainly did used to be. And they have had a lot of say in how Christians have read and understood the book of Daniel. And to be fair, um, much of what I have to say today is going to overlap with some of the things they would say. And that is what gets me to this, this disclaimer that I have in mind, this warning for you as you hear me talk about the book of Daniel. There is going to be some overlap between what I say and what you maybe have heard other Christians say about the book of Daniel. However, I do not want any of you to assume that I believe everything you have ever heard about the book of Daniel just because some of my comments are very similar to comments you have heard. In all likelihood, I have a lot of criticism of things that are commonly taught from the book of Daniel by a lot of Christians. And if I had the chance, I would talk about those things. Chances are I disagree or at least have hesitations about a lot of the common teaching on Daniel. Therefore, I would ask you not to make assumptions about my beliefs if I am silent on something. Whatever I do say in this sermon, I do stand by that to some degree. I at least thought it was worth mentioning. But for everything else, just uh, leave a question mark regarding what I think and what I believe and don't assume too much based on what I say to you today. And that is all the introductory comment and disclaimer I wanted to make about Daniel's book as a whole. So as we inch closer and closer to talking about this abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Uh, we want to make some other comments here first to, again, get us enough context to understand what we're going to read. I want to tell you about a king mentioned by Daniel, whom history calls Antiochus IV. And we need to understand him. Uh, I'm going to spend a whole uh, portion of this sermon on him. So this is my third heading in this sermon, talking about Antiochus IV. So we got to put this guy in his context. So Daniel, he was around about 600 years before Christ. You fast forward to like the 300s before Jesus, the 300s before Christ. You've got this guy named Alexander the Great, who uh, is called Alexander the Great because he conquered the entire known world at his time. You know, he, of course, could look across the last river and see there was other countries out there, but those were all the real exotic lands he could never get to. Pretty much anything else in the world that was really interconnected at that point from Greece all the way to uh, the borders of India. He conquered it. Uh, he just took over everything. And then he died at a very young age. And what happened when Alexander died was his generals divided up his empire among themselves. But of course, uh, why rule only 
a part of an empire when you can rule an entire empire. So all of those generals promptly began attacking each other, trying to win dominance over everyone else, trying to reunite the entire empire. That never really happened. None of them, of course, were as great as Alexander the Great. And so they never could do that. But by the time the smoke cleared, there were about four big kingdoms left out of Alexander's great empire. So there are four major kingdoms that came out of all that. Now, one of these was ruled by a guy named Seleucus. Again, one of Alexander's generals, a guy named Seleucus. And he had dominance over, the na over Syria, which is basically north, northeast of Israel, and then everything kind of east of Syria. So he had a pretty big chunk of the empire there. And uh, that was what he ruled. And he founded what is now commonly called the Seleucid Kingdom because his, his sons and descendants were very much ruling that for a good amount of time. Now the Seleucid Kingdom eventually gained power over Israel. Israel had been conquered by Alexander the Great, so it was part of that empire. And eventually that part of things fell to the Seleucid, empire, the Seleucid Kingdom, rather. And so Israel was under them. And that happened about 200 years before Jesus, so that gives you an idea where we are now in history. We're about 200 years before Christ. And for a while, Seleucid control of Israel was not that bad for Israel. They had a reasonable amount of freedom, reasonable amount of liberty to do as they wanted as Jews. Uh, but then all that changed, and that changed when a guy named Antiochus IV uh, became king of that Seleucid kingdom and therefore also king over Israel at that time. Now Antiochus IV had a really funny idea about himself, and I say funny uh, not because it actually is humorous, but because it is in some in kind of an ironic way laughable, but also just really, really weird. Antiochus thought he was the Greek god Zeus incarnate. He thought he was a living god, you know, the same guy that is allegedly up in the storms throwing down thunderbolts. Antiochus thought he was that guy. He thought he was Zeus. And for that reason, Antiochus called himself by a different name. He called himself Epiphanes, which means manifest. He believed he was Zeus manifest on the earth. And as such, as you can imagine, he demanded worship. After all, he fully believes himself to be a Greek god. Therefore, he needs to have worshipers. Now, for most people, that wasn't a problem. You know, most of this part of the world was pagan. You know, they're accustomed to worshiping many gods. What's wrong with worshiping one more god? Yeah, sure, we'll bow down and worship this guy, Antiochus, and that'll be it. But of course, for the Jews, it was a very, very big problem. You know, one of the fundamental aspects of their whole faith was there is only one God, the God of Israel, and not Zeus, and certainly not Antiochus. So that very much put the Jews at odds with Antiochus IV. And the Jews eventually became very much the subject of Antiochus's wrath. In the year 168 before Christ, uh, perhaps 167, but somewhere in there, he took control of the Jerusalem temple. So the, uh, the period of relative liberty that the Jews had was now coming to an end. This uh, man who believes himself to be the Greek god Zeus is going to take over their temple. And what he did first of all was he robbed the temple. He actually plundered it, took all the treasures out of it for himself, of course, because after all, he's Zeus, right? Why should he not have these things? After that, Antiochus then installed an idol, probably an idol of Zeus, given his own unique perspective on himself and things. He installed an idol on the temple's altar. So this altar where the Jews made their sacrifices, he set up an idol on that altar. He then proceeded to sacrifice a pig on that altar, which, as you know from the Jewish law, is probably the most egregious action you could probably do on that altar because a pig is an unclean animal. Like if anything, if any animal is not allowed to touch this altar, it'd be a pig or something like it. So he sacrifices a pig to his idol on that altar there in the Jerusalem temple, defiling it. And then finally, Antiochus began to systematically punish any Jew for obeying the law of Moses. So if you were trying to remain steadfast in the commands of Moses, you were probably going to be killed by torture in some terrible way. And we have plenty of records from that time about these things. Very difficult time for the Jews, for sure. Uh, 
Now this defiling of the temple, as you can imagine, led to a revolt from among the Jews. They're not going to take this lying down. This revolt was actually successful. It was very successful. By the year 164 BC, the Jews had retaken the temple, they had purified the temple, and they were able to use it for God once again. So they had a great amount of success in liberating themselves, and from there they just did more and more. They became a, you know, very much an independent kingdom at that time. And for those of you who have always wondered why the Jews celebrate Hanukkah, that's what Hanukkah celebrates, the liberating of the temple and the purifying of the temple at that time. So whenever the Jews are celebrating Hanukkah, now you know it was about being liberated from Antiochus IV and becoming an independent nation once again. Now I've told you all of that because you need to know how to understand what Daniel means by the abomination of desolation. And that's where we're going to turn now and find Antiochus IV in the book of Daniel. So what I want to do now under my fourth heading is look at two of the three passages where Daniel mentions the abomination of desolation. I'm saving the third passage for later, but the two uh, big ones for sure I want to talk about here very quickly. In both cases in these passages, Daniel uses this phrase for what Antiochus IV did to the Jews and especially to their temple. So the abomination of desolation very much refers, first and foremost, to what Antiochus IV was doing there in about the year 168 BC. Now the first of these passages is part of a long record about the wars between the Seleucids in Syria and the kingdom of Egypt. Egypt had been another part of Alexander's empire. It went to a different general. And in the effort for each of these generals to overcome the other, um, there was a period of warfare for a time between Egypt and Syria. And Daniel actually talks about that in some amount of detail in chapter 11. And if you want to turn there to Daniel, you can do that now. Daniel chapter 11. Now, <clears throat> in a book where many of the passages are very difficult, the passage I am about to read is not really debated. Uh, this is one of those rare places where bio, students of the Bible can look at Daniel and look at history, and they see enough similarity where they're like, yeah, we're pretty sure we know what Daniel's talking about at this point. So this is, <laughs> if it gives you any idea of things to come, this is the easy part of Daniel. Uh, here we go in chapter 11, right? But um, I do want to read part of this. I'm going to start reading in verse 29 of chapter 11. So Daniel 11, verse 29. Now, to give you some hints here, the he of this passage is the king of the north, as Daniel calls him, which we believe to be at this phase of things, Antiochus IV, because of the similarities we see to history. And if you have any questions about it, I'll tell you this. These ships from Katim that show up to get in the way of his plans, that is actually a force of Romans that came and intervened themselves in the war between Egypt and Syria at this time. Antiochus wanted to invade Egypt. The Romans intervened on Egypt's behalf and said, you go, you get out of here. And uh, Antiochus didn't want to fight Rome, so he turned around and went home. Or <laughs> before going home, he did something else, and we'll read about that here. Let's go ahead and read this passage. So now you've got some context historically. Daniel 11, verse 29. I'm going to read through verse 32. It says, at the appointed time, he, that's the king of the north, that's Antiochus IV, we believe, he will return and come into the south, that's Egypt, but this time it will not turn out the way it did before, for ships of Katim will come against him. Therefore he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the holy covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. Forces from him will arise and desecrate the sanctuary fortress and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolation. By smooth words he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. So all of that there is a very reasonable summary of history after Antiochus was turned back by these Romans from invading Egypt, he got really, really angry, and the Jews were on his way home, so he said, you know what, it's time to deal with these Jews. And that's when he started doing all those terrible things I mentioned earlier, took over the temple, 
You see there a reference to him putting an end to the sacrifices of the temple. That's another thing he did. He postponed the daily offering, and then he set up the abomination of desolation. doesn't say exactly what that is, but we know from history it was this idol that he set up there in the uh, Jerusalem temple. So not a whole lot of detail from Daniel, but enough detail to where we can match this up to those events. And it seems like, yeah, this is Antiochus IV, and this abomination of desolation is what he did among the Jews at that time. And of course, that reference to those who uh, know their God will display strength and take action refers to that successful revolt that happened where they were able to throw off Antiochus' rule and be independent again. Now, uh, that is one passage in Daniel where we see the abomination of desolation. There is a second passage that I do want to read at this time, and this one is in Daniel chapter 12. So you turn the page a little bit, go to chapter 12, the very end of Daniel's book. This passage uh, is actually the ending of the same record we were reading in chapter 11. So the events of chapter 11 kind of spill over into 12, and we get a few kind of final comments looking back on these things that Daniel has been talking about. And we again see a reference to this abomination of desolation. I'm going to read chapter 12, verses 11 through 12. So almost the very end of the book. But here's what he says. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. And that is what he wants to say there at that time. Now again, of course, we see the reference to the abomination of desolation. This time, Daniel makes reference to how long the temple will be defiled, how long that state of things will continue. Now, in case you're like me and you cannot do math very quickly in your head, Daniel says this period will last about 43 months, and he then pronounces a blessing on those who wait for 44 and a half months. So that's the 1,290 days and the 1,335 days. So about 43 months and then about 44 and a half months. So both numbers are slightly more than three and a half years. Again, for those of you like me, you can't do math very quickly in your head. Now in history, from the time that Antiochus began his persecution until the Jews reclaimed their temple, it took roughly that amount of time. Uh, so again, it seems like a pretty clear indication that we're talking about that time in history. Uh, so it's not, uh, we don't know exactly perhaps what to make of the two different numbers he gives here, why one is slightly longer than the other. But um, it's enough of a similarity that we're pretty confident this refers to the Antiochus and being liberated from Antiochus in the revolt the Jews staged at that time. So again, we're pretty confident at this point that we're understanding Daniel correctly. Now regarding these two passages from Daniel, I want to say one more thing. Other Jews actually did refer to Antiochus's actions as the abomination of desolation, by which I mean ancient Jewish literature looks back on Daniel, looks back on Antiochus, and they make this connection. I would like to read you a passage from the book of 1 Maccabees. If you've ever heard of this book, it is a, uh, a Jewish book written to really chronicle a lot of the events that happened back there during the time of Antiochus' persecution and the revolt that was staged at that time. It is one of the apocryphal books, but uh, very commonly read and used because it's so helpful as a historical source to know what was happening back then. Now, this is perhaps... Um, the clearest reference I could read, which is why I want to read this here. And just for the record, this is 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 54. I doubt any of you have a Bible with the Apocrypha in it, but um, if you do, you could turn there, but uh, I'm going to read it for you. So here is what they say. And this is, of course, a reference to the Jewish calendar. On the 15th day of the month of Kislev, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar and built idol altars throughout the cities of Judea, on every side, end quote. So he does that as he's describing all the terrible things Antiochus was doing there in the very first chapter of 1 Maccabees to give some context for all his record of the revolt that he's going to detail. But you see them use that word. He set up the abomination of desolation 
upon the altar. Okay? And we know from Josephus, I think I'm going to read that later. I might. If I don't, I'll tell you right now. Uh, Josephus also gives some detail about this time in history. And he's the one that says specifically that he set up an idol um, on top of the altar there in the temple and that that was the abomination of desolation. But here we actually see the phrase used by 1 Maccabees for that time. So this author made that connection uh, to the book of Daniel. And I just wanted to show you that uh, so that you know that I'm not, you know, we're not just coming to that conclusion you know, in our time. Back in that time, Jews were saying, hey, this must be what Daniel was talking about in his book. So all that to say, Antiochus IV, he's the guy who's primarily the, uh, you know, the agent of this abomination of desolation as described by Daniel, taking place in about the year 168 B.C., which should raise some questions for you, which we'll get into here now. In my fifth heading, I want to begin to answer how Daniel might connect to the teaching of Jesus. Because again, we're talking about the Olivet Discourse and what Jesus is trying to say about this great tribulation of Judea that he has in mind. Now, for everything I have to say about Daniel and the remainder of this sermon, I must admit I have a little less confidence. We're getting into those passages where it's not as clear. There's a lot more debate among students of the Bible as to what Daniel is describing. But the possibilities are worthy of mention, and I have enough confidence to at least mention them to you as we sort through these difficult issues. Now, in the Olivet Discourse, we see that Jesus predicts a future abomination of desolation, something coming beyond his time. Now, perhaps in your mind, this creates some tension between Jesus and Daniel. Daniel seems to have been talking about an event that happened uh, in about you know, 168 B.C., before Jesus, right? Whereas Jesus is very much looking forward to something beyond his time. So you might say to yourself, well, is Jesus using the book of Daniel correctly? Is there some tension there? What do we make of this? The point I want to make to you now is that Daniel himself seems to imply a later Roman version of Antiochus IV. So if we go back to the book of Daniel and think about what Daniel has to say in other passages, he seems to imply a kind of repeat of Antiochus IV at a later time, specifically during the Roman period of history, when the Roman Empire was becoming the dominant power. Now, to show you this, I want to read some other passages from Daniel. And this is why I, I exhorted you all more than once to have reread the book of Daniel, because I don't want you to get lost in all this. But I can just jump around and read a few passages. I can't, you know, read the whole portion for you. But I do want to read some other passages to you. Now, this first passage I want to read is from Daniel chapter 8. Now, <clears throat> this passage starts with the fourfold division of Alexander's kingdom, uh, which is portrayed as a goat with a great horn. That goat gets uh, defeated, and his horn breaks into four horns which matches the four primary kingdoms that came out of Alexander's empire, which is why I gave you that history earlier. I mean, you line it up with history, it makes sense, right? So we've got this presentation of Alexander's empire being broken up to the four winds. And uh, Daniel's even told that later on. He says specifically, this is the kingdom of Greece. So Alexander the Great was Greek, of course. But our focus is on something else. A little bit later on, after these, you know, this goat is slain and his horn breaks into four horns, and then this happens. Daniel chapter 8, starting in verse 8. I'm going to read through verse 11. It says here, uh, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land, probably Israel. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall down to the earth, and it trampled them down. Not bad for a small horn, right? Accomplished a lot. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. 
Now, all of that is rather cryptic language, but let's think about what we've already heard from history, and let's think about what Daniel says here. From Alexander's empire comes four kingdoms, and from one of those four kingdoms comes a king who removes the regular sacrifice and throws down the sanctuary. That should sound very familiar because I've been talking about that kind of thing with regard to Antiochus IV. He goes in there, takes over the temple, suspends the sacrifices to God, you know, sets up his idol and sacrifices a pig on the altar and does all those terrible things. Very, very similar to Antiochus IV. Seems like that's what this small horn here is coming out of this, you know, this uh, basically the Greek kingdom of Alexander, one of the four sections of it, and then that small horn comes out of it. It all matches pretty well with Antiochus IV. Now, I read that to you because there's another vision in Daniel's book that's very similar, very similar sounding to this one, but may not be about Antiochus, but might be about someone else later on. It's another vision about another little horn. And I want to read that one to you. This is from Daniel chapter 7. So this is backing up in Daniel's book, actually. Daniel chapter 7. This is from the, uh, the vision of the four beasts. For any of you that are, uh, have reread Daniel recently or remember this, this is where he sees the vision of you've got the, uh, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and then this fourth strange beast, and then the kingdom of God. So it gives you kind of this jet tour of history. That's where we are. I want to jump in here and read something said about the, uh, the time of this fourth strange beast. This is Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Here's what he says. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and exceedingly strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one. A little one came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. And that's enough for now. Now that passage is greatly debated. Uh, this is one of those passages where people really start to kind of have different ideas about how to read Daniel. Some people think that this fourth beast and its little horn is another description of that kind of Greek period where Alexander's empire is split up and you got all these other kings doing stuff and one of them being Antiochus later on. And some people will say, well, this little horn here is the same as that other small horn over in chapter 8. It's just another description of Antiochus IV. That's all it is. Some people read it that way. Meanwhile, others believe that in the flow of Daniel's history, especially in this vision of the four beasts, not all the details line up very well with all of that. Some people think that this fourth beast lines up with a later empire that came after that Greek period, after Alexander's empire was divided up and all of that, which in history would be Rome. It would be the Roman Empire that became the next great empire of history at that time, which means this little horn that shows up, you know, from this fourth strange beast would be something happening in the Roman period, you know, in the time when uh, the Romans had taken over Israel and all of that. Now, I myself am more inclined toward interpreting the fourth beast as Rome. If this were a study on Daniel in particular, we might get into more detail on that. For now, I just want to note that it is debated, but I do think that argument can be made and I am more strongly inclined in that direction. And yet, that is very telling for our purposes, looking at all this stuff about the abomination and des of desolation. Because in describing this fourth beast and this little horn that comes out of this fourth beast, he uses some language that's very similar to his language about Antiochus IV. They're both small horns or little horns doing these great things well beyond them great and terrible things, to be clear, which makes it sound like, okay, is there, is there a meaning there? Is there a hint there? Is Daniel implying a similarity between what Antiochus IV was doing during his time and what someone's going to be doing in this later Roman period? Is there a similarity there? Is there an echo? Is there a copycat? You might put it that way as well. <clears throat> 
All of that is very relevant, of course, because when Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse, this great tribulation of Judea and this great Jewish revolt during the Roman time, I mean, that might mean that Daniel is actually trying to hint at something that's going to happen at that time in history. And that is a very, uh, I mean, that's a very strong possibility there. And I want to use that to talk about my last heading here before we're done. I just want to say, based on that, that Christ seems to have reasonably predicted another abomination of desolation during the coming revolt of the Jews against Rome. So this comes very strongly back to the Olivet Discourse. Let's go ahead and reread our passage from the Olivet Discourse. Let's just read Matthew 24, verses 15 through 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, knowing what we know from the book of Daniel and knowing how Jews understood the book of Daniel, what Christ says here does seem a little bit strange at first. It's very odd for him to talk about a future abomination of desolation. If you had asked any Jew about the abomination of desolation, he or she would have probably told you that it refers to something that had already been done by Antiochus IV, about 168 years before Jesus, before Jesus was born, that is. And that is, it's a done deal. I mean, Antiochus already did that. The abomination of desolation is past. There is no future abomination of desolation. That's just way off. That's what most people, most Jews at that time, would have said, undoubtedly. But as for Jesus, he says that the abomination of desolation refers to something that would happen later after his time, something down the road. Now, in my opinion, the wording of Christ in this passage is understandable if he means to say that Israel will yet again experience something like what Antiochus did. If we said no more than that, I think that's sufficient to explain what Jesus says here in some degree, um, that there's going to be something very, very similar. What he's saying here basically is, hey, you remember all that stuff that Antiochus did all those years ago and how terrible it was? That kind of thing is going to happen again to you, and you're going to see it. And that's going to be this great tribulation of Judea. It was a terrible time when Antiochus was doing it, and it's going to be terrible, perhaps worse, uh, whenever it happens all over again. Now, all of that in its sense, in its by itself would make some sense. Furthermore, I do want to say this and connect this to some things I said from Daniel. Christ is correct to say this if Daniel himself, as I have suggested, implies that there's going to be a later Roman version of what Antiochus IV did. That's why I read you those two passages about the small horn and the little horn and how similar they are and how one of them seems to be Antiochus IV, but the other one might be someone a little bit later someone further down the line in that Roman phase of history. If that is what Daniel is implying there, then Jesus is all the more correct to use that phrase, abomination of desolation, not just for what Antiochus did, but for what this later Roman thing is going to be. It makes more sense for him to do that if indeed Daniel is implying that. Again, we're talking about debated portions of the book of Daniel, but it's a strong possibility and one that really makes this passage make a lot more sense, rather than just implying a similarity between what Antiochus did and what would happen a little bit later after the time of Jesus. There's not just a similarity, there is an implied sort of double prophecy from the book of Daniel itself about this in the way Daniel has worded some of his visions. And that would make what Christ says here all the more reasonable. Now, I only want to do one more thing at this time before I call it quits and not mention the book of Daniel again for like 10 years or whatever. <clears throat> I just want to do one more thing. And I want to uh, talk about <clears throat> another portion of Daniel that sheds perhaps a little bit more light, but uh, guess what is also a highly debated passage. So again, we're talking about possibilities. We're talking about things that are not quite certain, but which might be the case and which might further 
uh, explain what Jesus does in this passage and how what he says is very reasonable. I want to read the only other passage in Daniel. This is the third passage where Daniel refers to the words abomination and desolation together. He doesn't actually say abomination of desolation, but he strings those two words together pretty closely, and it's pretty hard to ignore them when you've seen them in other parts of Daniel. Now, this passage I want to read, this is the notoriously difficult prophecy about the 70 weeks. So if you remember or think back to reading the book of Daniel, this prophecy of the 70 weeks, I'm going to read that. And, of course, I renew all of my hesitations and all of my disclaimers about the book of Daniel and uh, not assuming too much from the things I say. So let's read this. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. So here is what uh, I believe it is Gabriel talking to Daniel at this time, uh, giving him a bit of wisdom here. He says to Daniel this, Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place, or simply the most holy. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince... There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. It's desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until they complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So there's quite a phrase for you. On the wings of abomination comes one who makes desolate. And two of those words should sound very familiar to you by now. The abomination of desolation its kind of worked into that phrasing for this person that Daniel foresees at this point. Now, again, highly debated passage. What does this mean? Some Christians, and I do emphasize some, and there's definitely a reason for the debates here, but some Christians view these weeks as ending with the first coming of Christ and the following destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, which we've talked about in the prior sermon as the events of the great Jewish revolt. In particular, among those Christians, week number 70 is considered by those Christians to be the great Jewish revolt. Is that perhaps what Daniel means when he says, on the wings of abomination will become one who makes desolate? Well, that time was certainly an abominable time and a desolating time. So the language at least does fit somewhat. And if so, if that is right, if this 70 weeks does culminate in that you know, anti-Roman revolt from the Jews, and these phrases do describe that, that is just all the more reason for Jesus to reach back and use the phrase abomination of desolation to refer to the time of the great Jewish revolt. In which case he's doing that, you know, not sort of as a creative way of using Daniel, but as an interpretation of Daniel. In which case, you read through the read between the lines of this very difficult prophetic book, you have two abominations of desolation, one practiced by, by Antiochus, and one coming later in this perhaps Roman period in this later time, also mentioned in these seventy weeks. Again, do not quote me on any of that. Um, I know it is on record here on video, but uh, again, I, I, I express to you my hesitations there and the acknowledgement that Daniel is a difficult book. We're talking about possibilities at this time, but possibilities, if they prove true, would make a lot of sense out of what Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse and makes his use of that phrase, abomination of desolation, all the more reasonable. And that is the sum of what I want to say today. I'll go ahead and give a review here at the end. I know this feels partially like overkill, and partially like too brief maybe to be of any use to some of you. Uh, 
but I hope I've at least given you some reasons to understand the abomination of desolation as some event during the great Jewish revolt and not just what Antiochus did um, in that previous time. To review, let's just go through those six headings again. Uh, first of all, I made the point that the wording used in the Gospels and also in the book of Daniel connects well to the great Jewish revolt. Abomination of desolation describes a lot of what was experienced at that time. And if my summary of history for you last time wasn't enough, I have more to tell you about all that, and we'll get there. Well, my second heading today was I made some introductory comments about the book of Daniel and also a disclaimer talking about what Daniel does in his book and also just kind of warning you against the difficulties of that book and uh, not, uh, you know, not being too eager to understand it all very quickly because it's a very difficult book. Thirdly, I told you about a king mentioned by Daniel named Antiochus IV. I talked about his abomination of desolation and uh, his efforts there to basically you know, bring down the Jews and their religion for good and uh, turn as many of them to traitors as possible. And then fourthly, we talked about two of the passages where Daniel mentions the actual phrase, abomination of desolation. And I made the argument that those seem to prefer, those seem to refer pretty clearly to what Antiochus was doing. And that time there about 168 years before the birth of Christ. So I made that point. And then finally, I implied, or I, I said that Daniel may imply, rather, that there's going to be a kind of later echo of Antiochus in a later phase of history, the Roman phase perhaps, in that uh, vision of the fourth beast that I read to you from chapter 7. And I made connections to some of that language with language about Antiochus and showed how Daniel does that perhaps. And then finally, I just said that Christ has reasonably predicted another abomination of desolation during the coming revolt of the Jews against Rome. And in the very least, he means to imply that something similar is going to happen, but he may be getting that from Daniel himself. That may not be just his innovative application of Daniel's language. He may be getting that from some of the details of the book of Daniel, which, if true, just makes it all the more reasonable for him to say that. And I know that a lot of that I left at the realm of possibility, but I did not want to say too much uh, before I you know, spend like 20 years trying to figure out the book of Daniel or something like that. But that is the sum of what I wanted to say this time. Uh, next time, we're going to move forward to the next obvious question, and that is, what exactly happened during the great Jewish revolt, which might be called that abomination of desolation? Is there a precise event? Is there a precise person or thing that Jesus might have in particular in mind for this abomination of desolation during this great tribulation of Judea? Well, we will try to answer that question next time. We're basically going to combine my sermon from a week ago with this sermon, kind of overlap them, and come up with some options for what Christ may have in mind. And that is what we're going to do my next sermon about a week from now, and that is all for now. If there are questions, I will try to answer them, or I will very humbly refuse to answer them depending on what those questions are. Um, does anyone have any questions or even comments on this?